Welcome in this video of the House of Asian Cinema. As we saw in the previous video, the West had found in the Soviet-Afghan war a perfect cinematic battleground to continue its ideological reconquest. But it was also an opportunity to denounce the war crimes that had been committed, and it gave a voice to the people directly affected by the conflict, the Afghan people. Russia being the other country directly involved in the war, its cinema had many opportunities to deal with the conflict and its consequences. And if the affirmation the conflict was the reason for the USSR downfall are grossly exaggerated, there is no doubt it had a profound impact on Soviet society first and Russian one after. In this video, we will see how cinema of both entities has dealt with the Afghan war. During the first years of the conflict, the USSR didn't publicize much what was happening in Afghanistan. People knew some kind of international solidarity operation was taking place there, but had no clue of its scale and the fights going on. When the zinc coffins started appearing on the Union's airfields, the veil of secrecy was harder to maintain, but the authorities persisted in understating the events. Of course, in this context, Soviet cinema could not deal directly with the subject. Some references to the British-Afghan war in another film were even censored to avoid a potential parallel between the current conflict and the failure of the former colonial power. Still, there were a few attempts to produce films in this context. Thus, scriptwriter Genrik Borovic and actor-director Yevgeny Matveyev were commissioned in 1980 to make a movie on the subject. But after a six-month-long research trip in the country, Borovic decided to give up, judging the intervention was a mistake. A film was finally produced in 1982, titled Hot Summer in Kabul, and taking inspiration from a book of the same title published the year before, it was made by Ali Amroyev and follows a Russian doctor going to Afghanistan. There, he discovers the atrocity committed by the Mujahideen. One of the very few Russian films on the war to have been really shot in Afghanistan, it was obviously a propaganda piece ordered by the Ministry of Information to support the internationalist cause, official justification of the Soviet intervention. Released in April 1983 to coincide with the fifth anniversary of the Sawa Revolution, when the communists took over in Afghanistan in 1978, the film failed to make a strong impression on the audience. No other films on the war were produced during the two following years. Things evolved with the entrance of Secretary-General Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. The reform-oriented new leader started the Glasnost, a policy of openness and relaxation, and Perestroika, its political and economic equivalent. He decided for a gradual fallback of the Red Army from Afghanistan. In this context, the intervention in the Central Asian country became a hot topic and film production started to touch on the conflict. Starting from 1986, the war appeared indirectly in films such as Attack or the popular romantic comedy The Messenger. The same year, the man who interviewed took an ambiguous position by describing a Soviet journalist investigating in Afghanistan following the spread of a dangerous virus masterminded by the CIA. Two years later, in 1988, the first audiovisual production to deal directly with the war finally saw the light of the day. The very first of them was TV series All Cost Paid, directed by Alexei Saltikov. The same year, a film finally reached the Soviet screens. Titled Churavi, the term used by the Afghan to name the Soviets, the film was directed by Sergei Nilov and tells how a Soviet soldier captured by the Mujahideen manages to escape. During his captivity, he remembers his life in Russia and his actions in Afghanistan before being made a prisoner. Barely more than one hour long, Shuravi deals with recurring themes in Russian cinema when it comes to the Afghan war. The disillusion from the young recruits regarding their parts in the conflict and the natural desire to go back home. Probably because the war was still going on, the film avoids to deal with the most graphic or controversial elements of the intervention. 
Shuravi looks like the necessary but incomplete first step in the cinematic revaluation of the war by Russian cinema. Two years later, Georgi Kuznetsov took the subject in his hands with Cargo 300. Here, we follow a Soviet supply column which American trained Mujahideen planned to raid. With its minimalist story and character development, it's hard to find a clear Russian viewpoint of the conflict in the film. At best, it helps to feel the kind of atmosphere there was in this type of convoys. A key dispositive in the Soviet strategy, given they were only able to control the big cities. The final action scene is typical of Soviet cinema of the time, lifeless and only saved by the deployment of real Soviet military hardware. This first clumsy attempt to describe the conflict would prepare the field for better filmmakers to deal with the subject. And in 1991, the first major film on the conflict finally got made, Afghan Breakdown by Vladimir Bortko. Co-written by journalist Mihail Leshinsky and former political advisor Leonid Bogachuk, who also produced the film, Afghan Breakdown is set in 1988, when the 40th Army is entering the final stage of its withdrawal from Afghanistan. Major Bandula, a veteran of the conflict, is in charge of a mechanized unit and must make sure everything goes smoothly. Despite the contradictory emotions of his men, the fatalism of his former allies, and the ambiguous relationships with their adversaries. For a film produced so soon after the end of the war, it is impressive to see how much Afghan Breakdown manages to have the hindsight to analyze the different human facets of the conflict. We witness the loss of ideals and emotional compass of the Soviet soldiers. Some turning opportunistic traders while others fear returning home. The palette of emotion is well illustrated. Even if the Afghans are less often present than their Soviet counterparts, they still have their place in the story. The translator even have an important part to play. A tragic figure of an Afghanistan hoping to enter the modern age, humiliated and split by the two sides of the war. Vladimir Bortko's direction makes good use of the arid landscapes of neighboring Tajikistan, making us feel the heat and dust of the country, another factor increasing the mental weariness of the characters. Without any fancy cinematic effects which would have distracted from the general realism, he captures with simplicity the raw emotions of his characters and serves well the grand scale of the military operations. Being an Italian co-production, the lead part is played by Italian actor Michele Placido. We could fear his performance would be out of place with the rest of the cast and the general spirit of the film. But that's not the case. Quite the opposite. The actor has perfectly understood the psychology of Major Bandura, a soldier trying to keep his moral values and sanity in a chaotic world where trust is not an option. His low-key performance is perfect for the character and the film. Afghan Breakdown is probably the most realistic film when it comes to describing the different aspects of the Afghan war and is a must-see for anybody interested in the conflict or lovers of war films. While Afghan Breakdown represents the best of the realistic approach, Russia also produced films in a similar spirit as Rambo 3. That's the case of Black Shark, directed in 1993, an attempt to reenact the Afghan war with a symbolic Russian victory at the end. But without the American expertise in action, Vitaly Dukin's film is a long tunnel of boredom made even worse by the clumsy action scenes. The film star is the Black Shark, a Russian attack helicopter with an aggressive design, and of which the film looks like a super commercial. If you are a fan of the machine, Black Shark is a must-see. You will be able to see it at every angle. If not, to watch this extended Airwolf episode is perfectly dispensable. Cinematic 
Sylvester Stallone's trilogy influence can also be felt in Desertia, which Yuri Muzika made in 1997, and in which a Soviet special force soldier go rogue to save his wife kidnapped by Mujahideen. With its story close to Peter McDonald's film, Desertia shows how much Russian cinema of the time, still under a strong Soviet influence, was incapable to shoot exciting action scenes. Igor, our John Rambo from USSR, has many opportunities to show he's better than anybody else, but the amateurish direction of Musica makes the fight scenes as exciting as watching a fireplace video. Like Cargo 300 or Black Shark, the only interest is to be able to see the Soviet arsenal in action. Because when Igor decides to leave his unit to save his lady, he does it by stealing a Mi-24 helicopter. Still, if the goal is to watch brainless action fest, better choose the Hollywood expertise rather than the post-Soviet one. Let's get back in time in 1994 when Timur Bekman-Metov, future director of Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and Gennady Kayumov made Peshawar Vals a weird piece of filmmaking mixing the best and the worst of cinema. Set in 1985, we follow an English reporter and a French doctor visiting a Pakistani prison where Soviet soldiers are detained. But they manage to arm themselves and start a rebellion. The film is based on the Babadar Uprising, a Pakistani fortress transformed into a prison to receive Soviet and Afghan prisoners. In 1985, they managed to take control of the armory and repel the assault of the Pakistanis and Mujahideen for almost 24 hours. The uprising ended with the explosion of the fortress for reasons which remain still mysterious to this day. Beckman Betov and Kayumov's film choose to mix found footage and conventional filmmaking. This surprising mix is hard to follow during the first third of the film unable to introduce correctly the main characters. But it proves to be an asset once the uprising starts. The chaos already present finally makes sense. We are really in the middle of this confusing revolt where madness, death and despair are everywhere. In a way, it feels like we are watching a war film as Andrei Yulavsky would have made it, with its feverish characters and its apocalyptic atmosphere. The film denounced the American and Pakistani implication in the war, something fairly classical in Russian films about the conflict. But it's also symbolic of the disillusionment of the people toward their government, past and present. Indeed, here it's the Soviet leadership which is blamed for the death of the prisoners, turning a blind eye when they try to contact them, and later on getting rid of them through carpet bombing. Hard to be more disillusioned about the war. The film was bought by Roger Corman and released in 2002 in an altered version under the title Escape from Afghanistan. You may remember he did the same thing back in the 60s with Soviet science fiction films. The uprising was also used as an inspiration for the Ukrainian Afghaniets back in 1991 and the subject of a Russian TV series in 2018. It took more than 10 years for Russian cinema to touch again directly on the subject of the Afghan war. During that time lapse, the local cinematic landscape had considerably evolved. Under the impulse of such blockbusters as Daywatch, from Peshawar Vals director Timur Bekman Betov, Russian cinema was getting rid of its last Soviet habits and enter the phase of Americanization, aiming for more entertainment and an increase of production value in order to compete with Hollywood. Fedor Bondarchuk, the son of prestigious Soviet filmmaker Sergei Bondarchuk, was part of this enterprise when he made the Ninth Company. Set during the last years of the conflict, we follow a small band of Soviet recruits in their training and then servicing in the Central Asian's country. 
Regulars of American war films will be completely at ease when they will be watching The Ninth Company. With its full metal jacket structure, its vibrant photography, its quick editing, its exaggerating and heroic war scenes including an apocalyptic climax based on the fight which took place on Hill 3234, celebrated by Swedish metal band Sabaton, The film is one of the most easily accessible to mainstream audience amongst all the films discussed here. Fortunately, this Americanization process doesn't impede the Ninth Company to propose a solid reconstitution of the war. If the first half of the film, the recruit's training, follows the template set by American films on the Vietnam War, it is quite unique in Russian films on the conflict, and while it's not as sharp as Kubrick's version, it is still a good opportunity to show some of the abuse linked to Soviet discipline and to get acquainted to the different characters. <laughs> While the director chooses to highlight the comradeship and the coming of age aspect of the story, there is still a large degree of disillusion when it comes to the reason that led them to Afghanistan and the political and military leadership. After all, Fedor Bondarchuk had himself served in Afghanistan, so it makes sense he manages to inject enough realism in his film. Thirty years after the end of the conflict, director Pavel Lungin, who had made a name for himself during Glasnost for his social films, came back to the subject for leaving Afghanistan. As was the case of Afghan breakdown on the 9th Company, leaving Afghanistan takes place during the last years of the war. While the 40th Army is preparing its final withdrawal from the country, a Soviet general's son is captured by some Mujahideen. The general asks Mitrich, the local KGB officer, to do everything in his power to bring him back. Heavily criticized by some veterans and nationalist organizations when it was released, leaving Afghanistan is nevertheless a perfect synthesis of the complexity of the conflict. We have the main archetypes symbolic of the war. The new recruit disillusioned by the war, the old-timer trying to make as much money as he can by trafficking with the enemy, the Afghan communist soon to be abandoned by the Soviets, the opportunistic Mujahideen, the noble warlord inspired by Massoud, or the Soviet soldiers who had switched sides as did Nikolai Bistov. Amongst this gallery of characters, Mitrich is the pole of stability. He is the most pragmatic and tries to cling to his values despite the chaos around him. By doing so, he is in a similar position as Afghan Breakdown's Major Bandura, a film with which leaving Afghanistan has many common points. In a way, Pavel Lungin's work is the ultimate film on the Afghan war. It is the one who manages to blend the different aspects highlighted by the previous films dealing with the subject, but with a greater technical and directorial mastery. If the USSR and Russia have produced a fairly limited number of films dealing directly with the Soviet-Afghan war, its impact can be felt in the many films in which it is indirectly evocated. Thus, in his nickname is Beast, made in 1990, a veteran from the war has to face the Russian mob. A concept reused two years later for Red Mob. Still in 1992, a war veteran finds himself involved in a conspiracy to take power after the fall of the USSR for destroy the third leaf. In The Muslim, produced in 1995, a veteran comes back to his native village after several years being detained in Afghanistan. But his conversion to Islam creates waves in the small community. In Cargo 200 by Alexei Balabanov, made in 2007, a girl is abused by a policeman who has fallen in love with her while her ex-boyfriend is sent back to the Soviet Union in a zinc coffin. In Fossil, produced in 2012, a veteran who has fallen in coma during his time in Afghanistan finally wakes up in Russia 30 years later. In 1210, released the same year, a former soldier is haunted by his war trauma and on the verge of madness. While far from complete, the list clearly shows the conflict remained deeply entrenched in the Russian subconscious. 
we can pinpoint two tendencies among filmmakers. On one side, those who see in the lessons taken from the Afghan experience a way to restore order the tough way in a chaotic Russia. Some kind of vodka flavored vigilante flick. The others, the most numerous with time passing, uses the consequences of the conflict to showcase the social and cultural problems the country has to face. What conclusion can we draw from the way Soviet and Russian cinema dealt with the Afghan war? In the same way as the Americans did, the Soviets and Russians tried to use the power of cinema to satisfy their propaganda objectives and show the war in a more flattering light. But being hot summer in Kabul or desert here, they have all been even less successful than Rambo III or Charlie Wilson's war. Still, Russian cinema can proudly point to several films which have described with great realism the complexity of the conflict. So if you want to know more about the Soviet-Afghan war while watching quality films, go for Afghan Breakdown, The Ninth Company and Leaving Afghanistan. Thank you for having watched this video, I hope you have learned more about the way cinema dealt with the Soviet-Afghan war. Feel free to ask any questions or make any observation in the comment section below, I will do another video to answer them. Until then, I hope to see you soon on the House of Asian Cinema.